Today, we're going to move into another optics chapter. Now, you might say, wait, we finished optics and we had a test over optics. Isn't that done and in the past? Well, this is now going to be taking a modern look at optics. What we studied was more of a classical optics, and we find something very interesting. Our lab tomorrow is going to be studying this photoelectric effect that I've entitled the lecture. And it's by far the most expensive equipment we use. So we'll really be careful with the equipment in the lab tomorrow. So getting started, the word quantization. Yes, we're starting quantum theory here, kind of, because this is the origins of quantum theory. Quantization means you have discrete steps. So something we've already stated that is quantized is electric charge. Electric charge can come in units of one electron charge, two electron charge, three electron charge, four electron charge. You can't have something that's anywhere in between those. That's what we mean by quantized. You only have specific values that are possible. So <clears throat> if you have something that is continuous, it's not quantized. If it is only certain levels available, then it's quantized. Here's an example from something we've seen before. When you have a guitar string and you pluck it, it will only resonate at the fundamental frequency or an integer multiple of that fundamental frequency. So its resonant frequencies are quantized. It'll only resonate at integer multiples of the base frequency. Now, to be quantized does not mean it has to be integer multiples of a number. It means they have to be discrete levels. So here's a picture that just illustrates that. So the first clicker question, just making sure that you understood the, the one word I've said 70 times. What does it mean if a quantity is quantized? Brittany, okay, not Brittany, Angelina. Get in there. Okay. Okay, 14 people were listening to the words coming out of my mouth or had a good idea. These people up here fell into a common misconception. A common misconception because it's pretty close to reality, but not what the word quantize means. As I said, what, five or six times just before giving you the question, quantize means you can only have certain values, just discrete values, not continuous values. That's the definition of something being quantized. That's what quantum physics is studying, discrete values available to a system. But in a more general sense, quantum physics, we will learn, starting today, is treating the wave nature of particles. What that's saying is this stopper, you would say, for certain, this stopper is an object. It's a particle. The quantum physics says, this particle can be treated like a wave. And quantum physics is treating the wave behavior of that particle. Which sounds really bizarre, right? And quantum physics is mind-bending. 
this like relativity was kind of mind bending. By the way, speaking of relativity, I got an email from a student about the homework problem dealing with the momentum of the satellite. And the whole importance, part A is not the important part of that question. It should have missed part A if you do it wrong. Part B is the important part, and part B is where you're looking at what is the difference between the relativistic momentum and the non-relativistic momentum for that satellite. And the difference is very small. Your calculator probably won't calculate the difference properly. And that makes you say, well, how do you do it? That's the point of the problem. The point of the problem is if you factor out the MVs, then you can see what the difference is. But you have to use gamma is equal to gamma plus one half b squared over c squared to keep the one separate from the plus part. And then when you subtract the one subtract out, and you're just left with the one half b squared over c squared part, and you get your correct answer. Okay, sorry, I just remembered that. So why did I say that this top part is a common misconception? Well, according to quantum theory, this particle can be treated as a wave. And when you treat this as a wave, it's going to have only certain energy levels available to it, only discrete quantized energy levels. Hence, it's a quantum system. But for something with this much mass, those discrete energy levels are so close together that we can't discern the difference between them. So it's like, you know, it can be an energy of zero or one times 10 to the minus 30 joules or 1.3 times 10 to the minus 30 joules, but none of us can measure down to 10 to the minus 30 joules. And so as far as we're concerned, those are just continuous. So only when you have something that is a small object, so the, uh, the object associated B is the one that, strictly speaking, is the misconception. When you have a small object, is the only time when you notice the quantized behavior. And so that's why people talk about quantum physics as the physics of the small, because you actually only see a difference if it's a really small thing. It still applies everywhere, but you only see a difference if it is a small thing. Just like relativistic physics is the physics of, well, if we talk specifically or special relativity, what we did, it's the physics of things that are going really fast because that's the only time you find a difference. So where does it all start? With black body radiation and the ultraviolet catastrophe. Now you guys can remember back, I brought out those cool glasses and I had a lamp here and I made it get hotter and hotter. And it got hotter and hotter. What did you notice about the color? Okay, that's not the color, but that was a true observation. It got brighter. It got brighter, and we now understand, according to the um, Stefan Boltzmann law, that the luminosity, how much light it gives off, is proportional to temperature raised to the fourth power. So it got brighter. But what about the color? How did the color shift as it got hotter? Okay. It started with not much in the ultraviolet region, not the purple region, because purple is red plus blue. Ultraviolet is one wavelength. Um, you're not the one who said that. If somebody else said that, I was make sure I correct that statement. Um, so it started with very little in the ultraviolet region, mostly red. The filament looked orangish at low temperature. But as it got hotter, it looked wider, and we saw more in the blue and ultraviolet. And that is the thing that started off this whole quantum idea. So physicists using classical physics, our understanding of you know, radiation, came up with a law that was perfect, according to physics, to explain how bright the light should be at each wavelength based on the temperature. Only one little itty bitty flaw. As the temperature gets hotter and hotter, of course the peak radiation moves, the, higher the, the hotter the temperature, the higher the frequency, that's what you observed. But their, their calculation, it's called the Rayleigh-Jones Rayleigh law, J-E-A-N-S, but he was French, so 
sounds more like Jones than Jeans. Anybody here speak French? No? I'm sure people do and just don't want to have to say words out loud. You don't? How many languages do you speak, Corso? Three. I'm always so impressed with these people who come in with polyglots because, yeah, you know I'm good at one. What well, kind of good at one? Okay, so the, the Rayleigh Jones theory said that, well, it maps very good long wavelengths what's going to happen if you change the temperature. But it said that at short wavelengths, no, regardless of what the temperature is, you're going to have an infinite amount of radiation. Infinite radiation at short, that is, ultraviolet wavelengths. That was perfect theory. There has never been a flaw found in that theory yet till today based on what they understood. But we know that can't be true because if you have infinite radiation at very short wavelengths, what does that tell you about the power being emitted by anything with any temperature? It must be emitting infinite power. We must have infinite energy per second coming off of every object. And all scientists knew that can't be true. So we here, here we have impeccable theory, done perfectly well, giving us what clearly is not the correct answer. And that's why it's called a catastrophe. This is a catastrophe of physics when your theories, this was at a time, by the way, when physicists thought they had it all figured out. They thought they understood everything in the world, and it was just maybe nudging the 17th, 17th digit in a constant. It was all that was left for physics, that there would be nothing new to learn. And then they have this catastrophe of their physics theory. So what do you do? Well, it comes down to Max Planck. In, on October 17, 1900, Max Planck was told by Heinrich Rubens that Wien's law, Wien's law is the law that tells us about the peak wavelength as a function of temperature for that emission. The Wien's law broke down when you got down to really low frequencies. And based on the information that Heinrich Rubens told him, which I think it was in a telegram, Max Planck sat down that night and said, well, if that's the case, then this equation should give us the shape of the radiation curve, the shape of this curve right here. So Planck said this equation should work, and his equation was exactly right. Now, the equation was only adding, you know, taking the equation that Rayleigh and Jones had come up with, basically, and multiplying it by another term. But it's pretty ingenious to me that he was able to, in one, you know, just given this information, say, well, then this must be the equation. Only one problem. We are physicists here. And physicists, it's not about getting the right answer. It's about understanding the ideas behind it, knowing why it occurs. The whole reason we study physics isn't to get right answers on tests. <laughs> it's to be able to understand why something's occurring, to be able to explain it. And so here we have Max Planck. He has given us the right answer, but he doesn't have an explanation of why it's correct. You know, I chose the answer C because, well, it just felt right. And it turned out when I tested it, it was the right number. But no reason on why he got there. And so that, to a physicist, is very distressing. So he gets down to work trying to figure out how could this equation that I came up with be the correct equation? What would make it correct? And in December, he proposed the revolutionary idea that maybe, just maybe, the energy of light is quantized. That light came in units called quanta, a packet of energy, such that the energy is equal to an integer multiple of some fundamental energy at any frequency. So 
So for each frequency, the energy was an integer multiple of some base amount. And he further defined a constant, the self-named Planck's constant, saying that that base energy was the Planck's constant times the frequency. So basically, the energy at some frequency f is equal to some integer n times Planck's constant times the frequency. Planck's constant is experimentally determined to be that value. So this is what Planck proposed. If this is true, then because of having discrete energies only and not continuous energies, going back to the theory, you have to use different statistics for discrete energies than you do for continuous energies. And using the statistics for discrete energies popped out his equation instead of the equation of Rayleigh and Jones. So now he had a theory to give him an equation, but it relied on this quantum hypothesis. He hypothesized that this is the case. He didn't say this is the case. He didn't have any reason to say this is the case, but he had, if this is the case, then I can explain my theory. So it feels better. Now we enter Einstein. There's a little interlude here, 1886 and 1887. That's before 1900 for those keeping track at home. 1886 to 1887, Heinrich Hertz was testing James Clerk Maxwell's theory. James Clerk Maxwell had said that light is an electromagnetic wave. And so Heinrich Hertz was studying electromagnetic waves to see if they did the same things that light does. So we've studied light as a wave. What are the wave properties of light? Hey, what? This was a question on the test, by the way. Okay, it diffracts. What else does it do that's a wave property? It interferes. Okay, it can be polarized. She said it's right. Other things, it refracts and reflects. Those are all wave things. Now, reflection can be explained by, you know, balls will reflect too, if you will. But those are wave properties. So Heinrich Hertz was making electromagnetic waves to see if they would do that. Can you polarize electromagnetic waves? That, to polarize electromagnetic waves, you do it the way people were thinking in class. Somebody asked me about this. You have a little mask with slits in it. That does work to polarize electromagnetic waves with long enough wavelengths. Light has too short a wavelength for that to work with light. So he studied polarizing the waves. He studied refraction of electromagnetic waves and so on. He confirmed that light and electromagnetic waves do have these same wave properties and thus said, yes, light must be an electromagnetic wave. Well, in the process of doing that experiment, he has a notation. Okay, so one would not say that he actually discovered the photoelectric effect, although some textbooks do. He had a notation that said that he found that the electromagnetic waves were emitted better when he, um, okay, I can't remember if it was when he polished them or something like that. I think it was when he polished them. And now we understand it was because the light shining on the polished things made it so the electrons would come off easier. <clears throat> so he didn't understand the photoelectric effect aspect of this, but he was the first one to observe this. Why do I say that? Because in 1905, Albert Einstein had his epic year. Remember, I talked about his epic year. I talked about his three papers, one on Brownian motion, one on a special theory of relativity, and one on the photoelectric effect. And which one was his crowning achievement of that year? This one, the photoelectric effect. This is what Einstein got a Nobel Prize for. Not for the theory of special relativity, but for this. So it's really important. So what Einstein said was, now this is 1905, it's five years after Planck. Einstein said, Planck was on to something. 
I believe that light really does come off in quantized units of energy. So not just if it does, but I believe it really does. That light behaves as a particle. Now, give him another decade or so, and he's going to come out with a more general theory on light that says light really is always a particle. It's always coming in quantized units in the particle nature. And I say always a particle, I have to back off a little bit. But it always has this particle nature associated with it. It's not just in the case of something giving off light because it's hot, but light in general. Originally, you say if it's giving off light because it's hot, you have little things that you could think of kind of like a string, and the string is only going to have certain wavelengths that it can oscillate at, resonate at, and thus you're going to result in only certain energies. That's what he said in 1905. And then later he said, it's not just those little oscillators, it's always. So he said light is coming off as a particle with units of energy, as described by Planck. So primary difference between him and Planck is he was the true believer. But he went a step further than that. He proposed an experiment. Now, I think I said this before. As far as I know, Einstein never did an experiment. Experiments were for the lesser people. I'm an experimentalist, just for the record. Um, he proposed an experiment that would test his hypothesis. So in lab tomorrow, your hypothesis will be Einstein's hypothesis that light comes off in packets of energy called photons with energy of Planck's constant times frequency for each photon. So how does Einstein propose we test this? Or how are you going to propose we test this? Well, photoelectric effect. It was, of course, known at that time that if you have light hit a metal, that you can kick off electrons. How does that work? <coughs> that light is carrying energy. And so if that light is absorbed, there's energy absorbed by the material. Now, why don't electrons just leave a metal? Why do electrons stay on metals? So what? Okay, if the electron leaves, then you're going to develop a more positive charge for the metal, right? It won't be charge neutral. And also those electrons were associated with an atom. That atom wants to be charge neutral. Now in metals, because we do this with metals, in metals the electrons for an atom are kind of delocalized. You have valence electrons are spread throughout the metal instead of stuck with the atom. So you have what we call an electron fluid or gas that's in the metal. But it's going to require energy to take an electron off of the metal. Um, that energy we call, well, if it was a liquid, we'd call it the surface energy. If it is this, we call it the work function. So it's going to require a certain amount of energy to take an electron away. But if you have the light come in and it's energy absorbed, then that energy could be given to the electron. So let's say here is free and the electrons are all with energies down here. So if you have light come in, and it comes in, and an electron in here absorbs all of that energy, if that energy is enough to bring the electron up in energy above the free level, it can escape. So we have energy of light. So if that energy absorbed by the electron is enough to take it up above the free level, it can escape. Now, conventional wave theory said that the energy of the light is proportional to its intensity, proportional to how bright it is. And so a brighter light should produce electrons that come off with more and more energy. So conventional theory, and I'll write this over here, classical is what I should say rather than conventional, I've got to make my table a little better.
Those are the two things that we are going to vary. And what classical theory says, and then what quantum theory says. Quantum being the particle lies a particle. So classical theory says higher intensity gives you higher energy electrons emitted. Those electrons emitted, we call them photoelectrons. What's special about photoelectron? Nothing. They're just called photoelectrons because it's light that caused the electron to leave the surface. But they're still just normal electrons. So classical theory says higher intensity, you're going to have a higher energy for the electrons coming off. And higher frequency, I'm changing colors, I'm sorry. Higher frequency, according to classical theory, would do nothing. But Einstein said, if light is coming in packets of energy, and the energy of those packets is proportional to the frequency, the chances of an electron absorbing energy from more than one photon, photon being the name for a packet of light, the chance of an electron absorbing energy from more than one photon is very low, unless you go to super high intensity. So assuming that we're not going to have two photons absorbed by one electron, then the energy that the electrons absorb is simply going to be proportional to the energy of the photon. But the energy of the photon depends on the frequency. So according to Einstein's theory, higher frequency will give you higher energy electrons. And higher intensity means you have more energy per second, which means you have more photons per second. More photons per second means more photons absorbed by electrons, hence more electrons per second. So if you have higher intensity, you'll just get more electrons per second. So there's a quick, easy test that would either prove Einstein was wrong or confirm his theory. Remember, Einstein's famous for saying, there's no experiment that can prove me right, and only one experiment necessary to prove me wrong, because that's the way science works. We're testing to see if we can disprove something. If it agrees with the theory, we didn't prove it right. We just disproved it. Now, let's not forget, Thomas Young's experiment, what did it disprove? Thomas Young's double slit diffraction experiment. Well, it disproved light being a particle. He showed that light couldn't be a particle. And now Einstein's proposed this, saying this will prove that light's not a wave. Well, you're going to do the experiment in lab tomorrow to see if Einstein's correct or not. <laughs> As I said in the lab guide, don't let him down. This experiment has been done literally millions of times. And yeah, it's confirmed Einstein every time. Do you have a question? No, okay. <laughs> so the, the results of what really happens are these results. You're going to test those results in lab tomorrow. You're going to test to see if that's what really happens, see what difference it makes. Now let's talk about the actual method for doing this. So here's what the equipment is like that we're using in lab tomorrow. You have a metal plate. You see the metal plate there or this thing here. And then you have a collecting wire in the middle. Light is going to come in and hit that plate. So you see the instant light here. It's coming in. It's going to hit the plate. And when it hits the plate, it's going to give off an electron. What's the energy of the electron? Kinetic energy of the electron is going to be equal to the energy of the photon minus the energy necessary to remove the electron from the surface. So minus, and I'm just going to put W sub zero because we call it the work function, 
different sources use different symbols. So sometimes we have like phi or something like that. Minus the work function. Now I said that's the kinetic energy. Not necessarily because this electron could collide with things before it gets out. And if it collides with things, it's going to lose energy, right? If you're going really fast and you hit another person, you might bounce off, but you're not going to bounce off faster than you start. You're going to bounce off slower if you were going really fast because it has higher energy. It's moving faster. And so this is actually a maximum case. So kinetic energy is less than or equal to the energy of the photon minus the work function. Minus the work function because that's the energy required to break it free. <clears throat> now, if we put in the energy of the photon, according to Planck, a single photon has photon equals HF. So I can rewrite this equation as the kinetic energy of the electron is less than or equal to HF minus the work function. So we have a kinetic energy that is up to a certain value. We'll go back to this equipment. What are we going to do? We have the collecting wire. If an electron comes off of here, the electrons are going to fly around. If the electron hits the collecting wire, it could stay. But if the electron hits the collecting wire, now we have a voltage difference between the wire and the plate because the plate lost an electron, the wire gained an electron, there's a voltage difference. And that voltage difference is going to require then a kinetic energy difference greater than the voltage difference for another electron to make it across. And so each time an electron goes from the plate to the collecting wire, the voltage difference between the collecting wire and the metal plate will increase until we reach the point where you no longer have any crossing, where the maximum kinetic energy of electrons is equal to the energy required to cross the gap. If that's the case, if this voltage here So I'll put a maximum. Now voltage is energy per charge. So over the charge of an electron. If that's the case, then I'll stop having electrons make the jump. So what happens is you build up a voltage difference until you reach zero current. That's what we're going to use for our test then. We're going to be measuring the current. And when the current is zero, we measure the voltage difference is going to make the current zero. And we say, aha, that's the maximum kinetic energy then that the electrons have. So we're going to measure in a fairly direct method the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons. And then we're going to compare to this equation. And so since kinetic energy max of the electron should be voltage that we measure times E, then I'm going to have, we call it the stopping voltage because the voltage required to stop it, times the charge of an electron. Let's divide everything by E. And we have the stopping voltage is equal to H over E times the frequency minus the work function over E. So we're going to take this and we're just going to say, hey, let's make a graph. Let's change the frequency. So we'll make frequency as our independent variable. And the stopping voltage will be our dependent variable. And so we'll make a graph that has the stopping voltage as a function of frequency. 
So we'll use different frequencies of light, different colors of light. We're going to use light from mercury vapor lamps. Let me warn you right now. Mercury vapor lamps put out ultraviolet light, which is bad for your eyes. Do not look at the ultraviolet light. Right? We will have things confined, so you have to actually get your head the wrong place to look at it. Don't do that. Right? Because we don't want anyone to damage their eyes. That would be bad. Question. Well, um, I guess what you were talking about, the how like it's like a plate that like photons are hitting that one. So how is the light going to go through that? Is it going to have to be like all covered up and just like, shoot a little right? Yes, we're going to. Our apparatus has a hole, and that hole is here, and we're going to shoot light through that hole. Okay, so if you look at my graph, if this equation is true, what is the graph going to look like? Where is its y-intercept? Is it a positive or negative y-intercept here? Negative sign there, so it's a negative y-intercept. Is it a positive or negative slope? Positive. So that means our line should look something like this. And what should the slope of the line be? Okay, a lot of people are whispering. H over E should be the slope. And so we'll be able to, since we know the charge of an electron, we're intimately familiar with that by now, we'll be able to calculate what Planck's constant is. If we don't get Planck's constant, we know we have a problem. Second thing we'll be able to do is we'll be able to measure that work function. Now that work function, technically this is the work function over E, which is just the work function in units of electron volts. So I put here phi just to represent it's the same thing but in unit, different units. So you'll just measure that y-intercept and that is your work function. That's how much, well it's minus actually, that's how much energy is required to remove an electron from your surface. So we're going to be able to test this if it's a straight line. That's in, agree in agreement with Einstein. If the slope of that straight line gives you Planck's constant, that's in agreement with Einstein. You're going to find the work function. So those are your resultish things. We're also going to test, though, what about the, the classical theory? Classical theory says that changing the color makes what difference? None. So if it looks like this instead, then you say, ooh, classical, burn Einstein. We're going to make another graph. We're going to change the intensity because notice in our table, we had high intensity was another thing. So we're going to change the intensity and see what difference that makes. Actually, we're changing the aperture size, which is not changing the intensity, but it's changing the power because the intensity is the same. You're getting a smaller area, hence less power. Less, still less area or energy total. And so we're also going to make a graph of the um, the power versus stopping voltage. If Einstein is correct it would look like this. And if classical theory is correct, it's going to look something like, like that. What you're going to find is going to look like neither of these, but very close to one of them. The reason it doesn't look like either of these is because the equipment is not perfect. The voltage drains somewhat between one electron and the next electron. At high intensity, the amount of drain is minimal. But at low intensity, the drain is measurable so that the average voltage for the stopping potential is a little bit lower because it's peaking, coming down, peaking, coming down, peaking. So those are the tests we're going to do in lab tomorrow. What's important about this photoelectric effect?
What? It is something that would confirm or disprove the idea that light is behaving as a particle. And everything we're going to do for the next week or so is going to be light is behaving as a particle. So it's important to have this, this Nobel Prize winning idea tested so that we can have some faith. Yes, light really does behave as a particle. We've always seen experiments that said, yes, light really does behave as a wave. Now we're going to go see if it behaves as a particle. <coughs> okay, I've already talked about all these things. So, clicker question. Who originated... Okay, it's not open yet. Sorry. Who originated the idea of light being quantized? Perso and Angelina. Gotcha. All right. We are neck and neck on this. Zero, zero, ten, nine, zero, zero. Now I am pleased nobody answered a name that we have not discussed. That's making progress. Well, we did mention Wien, Wilhelm Karl Werner Otto Fritz Franz Wien, um, famous for Wien's law, which says that the wavelength peak is equal to a number which, for reasons I cannot explain, I don't remember for a second, divided by temperature. That tells you the peak wavelength as a function of temperature. That's Wien's law, not the one who came with the light being quantized. Hermann von Helmholtz, very big name. You probably heard Helmholtz free energy or things like that. <laughs> um, John William Strutt, third Baron Rayleigh, is the one that we talk about in physics a lot, but not the correct answer here. I don't know why I have Robert John Strutt here, fourth Baron Rayleigh. So it comes down to Planck versus Einstein. Who originated the idea? Well, Clearly, we're 50-50 split, as close as we can be to that. The person who came up with the idea was Max Carl Ernst Ludwig Planck. He came up with the idea in 1900, December of 1900. He said, if light comes in only quantized amounts of energy for a given frequency, then I can give you a, a theoretical explanation for why my equation's right. Who was the true believer? Einstein was the true believer. So the correct answer here wasn't the true believer. It was who proposed it. So Planck proposed it. Einstein was the one that sealed the deal. Question we haven't covered. What are x-rays? So this one here is not checking to see if you've been paying attention. It's checking what your preconceived notion is. Obviously, I have a low threshold in my expectation for preconceived notions. You could be completely wrong. That's okay with me. Okay, James and Angelina. All right, we're all in. Now I've got to figure out how to make it close. Well, I must close it. I believe that was the answers we got. It's not like it'll tell me or anything. The majority are correct. Well, not the majority. There is no majority. 
The majority are incorrect, but the plurality are correct. X-rays are high energy photons. So why don't we just call them photons? Why don't we call them ultraviolet photons? Because they are, X-rays are ultraviolet photons. The reason we call them X-rays is because of their source. They're named based on their source, just like gamma rays are named because of their source. Gamma rays are ultraviolet photons, X-rays are ultraviolet photons. So what is this here, X-ray? Here's an X-ray tube. This X-ray tube is exactly the opposite of what you would use for the photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect, you would have light coming in, so reverse those squiggly arrows for light. They hit the surface and you would have electrons fly off. This was just the opposite. You had electrons coming off of the hot filament. You use a voltage difference, see this high voltage difference, to accelerate the electrons so they hit that target really hard. And when the electrons hit the target really hard, it produces light. So that's what x-rays are. They're light produced when electrons slam into our metal target. Of course, we want to understand how the x-rays work. I hope you don't look at that and say, oh, yes, I know. That makes sense. Right? Just the conversion of energy into light is not in and of itself a sensible process. So let's look at the process here. First of all, if an electron changes its direction, it's accelerated, right? Because acceleration is changing the direction or the velocity. It turns out, according to electromagnetic theory, any time a charged particle is accelerated, it gives off radiation, gives off electromagnetic waves. And so if I have an electron that comes close to a nucleus and deflects, as it deflects, it's going to give off radiation. Now, the maximum energy it could give off would be its total energy. So the maximum frequency would be if all of the energy divided by Planck's constant, remember, e equals HF is the energy for a photon. So the, the maximum frequency would be the total energy divided by Planck's constant. You cannot have an x-ray tube that gives off a frequency higher than that. And so, call it F0, it can give off anything lower than that. How would it give off this max amount if the electron goes from moving to instantly stopped? It would give off all of its energy in one photon with that level. Well, what are the chances of an electron going from moving to instantly stopped? Pretty much zero. So the intensity at that should be zero, but it's going to start picking up as we go to lower frequencies. So here is an experiment, experimental data, showing what the X-ray spectrum actually looks like. So you have on this axis, it has the energy in kiloelectron volts. Energy, huh? <clears throat> e equals HF. So that's proportional to frequency. So there's a maximum frequency, which corresponds to the maximum energy you put in that you can have. <clears throat> so you actually have, following a straight line here, for most of it. So you have a little radiation at this high energy, more as you go down and down and down. And then it comes here and you have it falling off. So all of that, what produced the energy outlined by orange here. What process produced that that I've just finished describing? The electrons were what were the electrons having done to them? They were being accelerated. The electrons were being accelerated because of that acceleration, it produced this. That accelerated radiation is called bremsstrahlung. That crazy word there, bremsstrahlung. 
It's German for breaking radiation, at least from what I'm told. I don't know enough German to say that's breaking radiation. But it's because of it slowing down. But then you have these things, the characteristic radiation, the characteristic x-rays. I will have to talk about those some later date, like Wednesday, because it's time for us to go. Have a good day. I'll see you in lab.